Welcome to this edition of The American Purpose. My name is Jack Moline, and I'm president of Interfaith Alliance. Sixty years ago, Henry Luce, the publisher of Life magazine, invited 10 prominent men to compose an essay on the national purpose. Then as now, there was a sense that we stood at the beginning of a time of cultural and political change. Our project expands on that work as each episode explores one perspective on where our nation was, where it is, and where it should be heading with a contemporary thought leader. My guests are from the worlds of faith, government, politics, and culture, and they have generously agreed to share this time with us. You can find out more about Interfaith Alliance and our mission to protect your faith and freedom at interfaithalliance.org and by listening to our radio program and podcast, State of Belief, at stateofbelief.com. But right now, let's find out more about the American purpose with my guest, Manjeet Singh, who is the co-founder of the Sikh American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Uh, most of us know it as SALDEF. Uh, Manjeet is also an entrepreneur in the tech sector and an activist for religious freedom, which he's been doing for a very long time and very effectively. And I'm very glad to welcome you here today, Manjeet. Thank you so much, Jack. Pleasure to be here. We're going to just get started, and I want to ask you the first question, which is, in your opinion, what was the original national purpose of the United States? Wow. That's a pretty um, pretty significant and important question. Now, uh, I'm going to preface my response by saying that I'm a first-generation immigrant. I came to this country 31 years ago. So... So my response is from my perspective. Um, and I think based on my knowledge and understanding of American history and the circumstances under which the country was formed, the purpose is to be a land of religious freedom, individual freedom, right to religious liberty, um, and, and that plural society that that we all talk about um, was the was the intent and purpose so that anybody who comes here could live their life without any fear any persecution from anybody uh, that in my in my opinion is is what was the original purpose and uh, what do you believe is or ought to be the American purpose going forward I think the simple answer is it's the same. I think based on what I've seen in the past, so I'm an avid uh, political junkie. I'm also a histor history junkie. Um, and based on what I've observed and my personal analysis is we need to refocus and recommit our, our actions as a country and as a society towards that original purpose. I think that original purpose is still valid 300 years, you know, today from when it was first espoused. We just need to, need to look at it and see um, how we are not being true to that purpose. So I'm gonna push you on this just a little bit because I won't say unique among the guests I've had, but unusually among the guests I've had, you've come to this country drawn to it, at least in part by your appreciation of what that articulated original mission was. Lots of people who have grown up in the United States, many of them in what we euphemistically at least call minority groups, have claimed that, that the original purpose of the United States was to benefit a certain segment of society that is trying to maintain its supremacy right now. Do you feel that as, as someone who's come to the country from elsewhere, is that is that something that you perceive as being accurate or is it uh, something that you feel is overemphasized by people who themselves feel marginalized? So I don't, I don't agree with that viewpoint. Uh, but I don't disagree with the fact that there is a certain minority that is trying to trying to assert its supremacy across American culture and society and, and the political spectrum. 
but I don't believe that was the original purpose. Uh, I, I, I believe the institutions that were established were designed to prevent such a thing. And we have, we have let those institutionals, you know, get weaker over a period of time where they, the, the power of those institutions are now such that they're not, they're not able to counter these current trends, political trends and wins that we are seeing. I think that's what we need to focus on. Very interesting. And, and that's, that's a terrific answer. Um, as you know, our society rests on foundational values. Some of them are admirable and some of them perhaps not so much. What are one or two of the values that the United States espouses that are worth doubling down on in our day and age? Um, democracy and democratic values, which is, you know, the for the people, by the people, right? Um, and, and, and religious liberty and, and individual freedom. That's extremely important. I think that's what we need to double down on. But at the same time, um, and I'm, I'm very passionate about this and I'm going to talk about this if you may, if you may, uh, you know, uh, Please. Uh, entertain my, my thoughts. Right. So I, I'll talk about something contemporary. You know, we know there is a new abortion law that was passed in Texas, extremely controversial, extremely right. talked about. So I personally am a person who believes in, in protection of life. I'm against the death penalty. Uh, um, so, so I would, I would prefer that people, you know, don't get an abortion. Women don't get an abortion. But at the same time, if somebody chooses to, I can't. I do not want to impose my beliefs on them. Right? Being a practicing Sikh, practicing Sikhs, observant Sikhs don't cut their hair on any part of the body. Now, does that mean that tomorrow the Sikhs become the majority you know, community in this country? Should we impose that all barber shops should be banned? Nobody should be allowed to cut their hair. Why? Right? As long as you have no restrictions from practicing your, your religious beliefs and your personal values, I should have no restrictions from practicing those. Right? And that's the problem that I have. I think people misunderstand this. this Right. So um, so where I'm going with this response is that that's what we need to we need to understand and uphold. Right? As long as your right does not impede my ability to practice my values and beliefs and rights and practices, we're fine. Manji, what are what are one or two of the values of our society that are holding us back from necessary progress? I think I think the way I would like to answer that question is there are values that we're not truly following, values that we're not truly practicing. That's what's holding us back, right? Um, equity, fairness, right? Democratic values, right? Like I am really troubled by the current trend of suppressing voter rights just because we are afraid of how those people that we're trying to marginalize and suppress their ability to vote, that their position and their beliefs may lead them to vote against, against a certain political ideology or a political position. That's troubling to me, right? Those are the values that we need to focus on. Those are the values that, that people look upon when they look upon, um, upon the United States. And yet we have developed this very, you know, convoluted perspective of view of that, right? When when it doesn't go my way, oh, it's not the right value. But when it goes my way, no, nothing in hell can stop you from 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 uh, you know uh, breaching that value. Right? And that double standard is what's hurting us. That double standard is hurting us domestically. It's also hurting us internationally because you can't pick and choose when you apply the value and you don't, right? And that's what I believe in. And in fact, I, I, I personally believe if, if, you're going to, if you're going to be, if you're taking a certain position, 
stick with the position. You can't change a position when it suits you and when it's convenient to you and then oppose it when it is not. That's not that's not a sign of a principle, uh, you know, character. And then that's what I believe is 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 are the values that really are looked upon looked upon by the rest of the world, but we need to just make sure we're applying it consistently. Even when those values, the outcome of those values applied may not be in our interest. When we, uh, when I was a kid and we'd play um, baseball on our street, if the ball hit the curb and took a funny bounce, we used to just say same breaks. Everybody is disadvantaged in the same way, just as everybody's advantaged in the same way. And uh, that's what you're describing here. You have to play by the rules. Yeah. Um, you know, most of our constitutional guarantees emphasize our commonality. You've been talking about that uh, equity and equality and the like. But the value, the, the, the right that you and I have devoted so much of our time to, the very first freedom in the Bill of Rights is a very personal one. Religion, the freedom of conscience. What values that are rooted in, in your personal belief system, in, in Sikhism, do you commend to those who don't necessarily share your beliefs? And, and I'm glad you asked that question because I can give you such a prime example from Sikh history. In our faith, not once, but twice. So I don't know if, if I can spend a little bit of time giving context for some of your listeners. Please do. So the Sikh faith was founded over a period of about 150 years. And there were 10, 10 um, spiritual leaders, they're called gurus in our, in, our, in our faith. And this is not a guru that you're a, you're a technology guru, you're a yoga guru. It's a guru who is a spiritual messenger of the divine. We had 10 of those. Each one, the first one, Guru Nanak, selected the subsequent um, guru and so forth until that chain continued until the 10th guru. These are human beings. And the 10th guru then eventually um, prescribed that guru shift of the Sikh faith to the Sikh holy scripture, the Guru Granth Sahib. Two out of those 10 gurus sacrifice their lives for religious freedom, not of themselves, but religious freedom of others. The ninth guru, who basically challenged the then, then you know, ruler of, of, of India, whatever that India was, it, India didn't exist as a country at that point. But this conglomerate of different princely states was ruled by this ruler which had had invaded India from abroad and so forth. And he was forcibly converting people into a different faith. And the Sikh, the, the nine Sikh Guru, Guru Tegh Bahadur, basically stood up to him and said, if you can convert me, everybody in India will convert. Now, he wasn't being threatened. His faith was not being threatened, but that's what he did. And I'll give you, and I intentionally didn't mention the faiths here because sometimes people construe it as, as being anti and pro certain religions. But I'll tell you, the ruler at that point was forcing people in India to convert to Islam or face death or persecution. The, the folks, the people who came to the Guru Tegh Bahadur seeking help were Hindu Brahmins from Kashmir. And they said, our faith is being threatened. If we don't oblige, we will have to forcibly be converted or will face death. And the guru told them, go tell the king that if he can convert me, all of you will get converted. Now, Sikhism has fundamental differences with Islam and Hinduism. Even though there are commonalities, there are fundamental differences. So here is a prime example of the Sikh faith, where one of our founders stood up for religious liberty, religious freedom, even when the beliefs of those people who were being persecuted, he did not prescribe to all of those beliefs. So to me, when I see this, and again, I'm going to put it in contemporary context, when I see this effort to, to you know, um, basically uh, prevent the right for abortion, and to, to prevent it from being a legal option. 
that troubles me, even though I personally would encourage and, and, and like if people would not use that option. But does, does that, that does not mean that I impose my beliefs on the rest of the country. Very, very powerful illustration. Tell me, Manjeet, how should our society pursue our national purpose? I, I personally believe, I think we need empathy. I think we tend to, we, we don't, we don't think about what what experiences and challenges and problems others are facing and and it's very easy to in an abstract way talk about solutions talk about things we should do to prevent you know provide a solution or provide some assistance i think we just need to empathize and think about there is more that is common as a human being we're all looking for happiness we're all looking for security we are looking for the well-being of our loved ones at the end of the day that's what we should be focusing on you know when we are creating an environment where people are disenfranchised where where people don't have the same level of opportunity that creates conflict and no society can thrive and move forward when there is conflict because it holds you back it distracts you and it and and it it, it ends up that valuable resources are now have to be devoted to, to address that conflict. Whereas those same valuable resources could be used to help everybody, you know, move forward to get better, right? I mean, education and, and, and learning, and those are the things that help people, you know, move up in society, you know, get more opportunities. And at the same time, have a common, common, you know, uh, playing field. You know, everybody has to abide by the same rules, right? Let the best athlete win. It's like it's like the Olympics. We just saw that recently, mm -hmm. right? You know, everybody goes through this, you know, very well laid out process to qualify. First within your within your county, then your state, then your country, and then you represent your country at an international level, and and the best. The final 10 or 8 athletes in the 100 meter sprint, you know, compete. So the, the, I, I, I imagine and I hope that's all representation of a, of a level playing field. Everybody has an equal opportunity. Let the best, best athlete win. That's what we need. Don't have, have barriers in place that prevent somebody from putting their hat in the, in the, in the game just because they're of a different color or of a different gender are prescribed to a different political ideology or come from a different national or ethnic background. Right? None of that matters at the end of the day. Right? That's what I believe is, is needed to, to you know, really move us, move us forward in the, as, a, as a country and as a society collectively. And how about the individual? What role does the individual play in pursuing our national purpose? Uh, recognize your civic responsibility and 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 fulfill it a democracy cannot thrive if the individuals comprising that that, that democracy that society are not paying attention to their individual responsibility right the reason our politicians are able to get away with the kind of you know bs that they do is because we don't hold them accountable there is no repercussion right and this example i, I i've been giving that lately more so than before um, you know, you go to the store, you buy a new cereal, you don't like it, you don't buy it again, right? It's the same thing. You, you gave a politician a chance. If they didn't perform, don't, don't, don't pass the vote again for them, right? So it's the same thing. And understand the power of that ballot and think about what they're saying, how realistic it is. Are they dividing or are they uni uniting us? No country, no society, no civilization can thrive and sustain itself if it is not united and if it is if it is constantly fighting conflict. It's a it's a it's a gradual demise. And the unfortunate thing is we don't see it because it's so gradual. It's so gradual that it's not visible, it's not tangible. 
and that's the that's the concern I have given what's happened over the last you know four to four to six or eight years it just and it's become worse um so I think as an individual we have to be cognizant of that it's it's almost as if each one of us are are individually have the responsibility to guard our democracy even though it kind of sounds but how is that possible that's what it is possible that that's how that's how each individual citizen is safeguarding democracy it's a clarion call for the integrity of our values and practice absolutely and having heard what you've just said let me ask you this last question are you optimistic about america's future yes i am yes i am i think there are too many decent well-meaning um, individuals and, and people in, in American society. We just need to, we need to all come together. Some may need a little bit of a jolt to wake them up that, hey, we need you. Okay, don't, don't, don't take this for granted. And, and we need to, you know, come together and, and you know, uh, hold hands and embrace each other and move forward as one block about decency and humanity and compassion and empathy and 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 you know those same values that that you know gave birth to this country is what we need to we need to use to energize and motivate um, well-meaning people terrific Manjeet, if people want to know more about the Sick American Legal Defense and Education Fund, about SALDEF, how can they find out more about the work you've been so involved in? Thank you, Jack. Yes, yeah, so people can go to our website. It is uh, saldef.org, which is S-A-L-D-E-F dot org. And they can learn about our mission and programs that we do. And and I should mention by, by making a plug here that even though the organization was founded, based on these six concepts and six values and to make sure we give a voice to the, the sick American community. We take a very prominent and a very explicit and bold stand when it comes to religious rights and religious liberties, regardless of who you are. Because it's the right thing. That's, it's rooted in, in the sick faith and the sick ethos. It, you know, it, it's what we, what we, as a Sikh, you grew you 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 grow up learning these things and you and you learn from our history and our tradition. And that's what we believe in and that's what we practice as an organization. It's part of our, our core values. So so we are uh, always here and welcome if you need support in your you know uh, fight for for justice, uh, social justice and religious liberty. Well at Interfaith Alliance we've always valued our our partnership and allyship with SALDEF. So um, I, I can endorse that plug. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And thanks to you, our listeners, for engaging with us and exploring the American purpose. It's been an honor and a pleasure to spend this time with Manjeet Singh, who's shared his perspective so generously. You can listen to this and other episodes at AmericanPurpose.org and learn more about our work at StateOfBelief.com and InterfaithAlliance.org. Interfaith Alliance has produced this program under the guidance of Ray Kirstein. I am Jack Moline, encouraging you to live with purpose. Mm -hmm.